I want to start this session by praying for what's about to happen in this room. It's really the culmination of all that's been happening in this room and in this area. We've read at different points over the last few days, Acts chapter 13, how as the church at Antioch was worshiping, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So the Spirit of God in a supernatural way set apart Saul and Barnabas to go where the gospel had not yet gone. And the church sent them out. So goers and senders. So at the end of our time in God's word, a few minutes from now, I'm going to invite people all across this room to stand. If they would say, if you would say, I believe God is leading me to communicate to my church a desire to go as a missionary, specifically to cross barriers for the spread of the gospel where it is not yet gone. And at that time, if you would say that you believe as God is calling you to stay, make disciples there in your culture and live to send others where the gospel is not yet gone, then I'm going to invite you to stay seated. So I want to be clear, that is not a call to divide this room into two tiers the super Christians who are goers and the sub Christians who are cinders, and the varsity and the JV. The most important issue at that moment is not going to be whether you are sitting or standing. The most important issue is whether you are being obedient to the Spirit of God in your life. And for some, obedience will mean standing. For others, obedience will mean sitting. And for those of you who believe God may be leading you to go, I want to be clear about what you're not saying when you stand. You're not saying that you are deciding today to move tomorrow to the Middle East. I would not call anyone to make a decision like that alone based on all we've talked about. So that's why I'm emphasizing that in your standing, you're saying that as best as you can know, you believe God is leading you to go to your church. If you don't have a church, to join a church, go to that church and say, I believe God is leading me to go to a place, people where the gospel's not yet gone. So please help me to discern this. Help send me if God is indeed leading me to do this. So that's the moment to which the next few minutes are headed. And I, we need the Spirit of God to lead us to that moment. So I want to pray. Before I even pray, I want to ask every follower of Christ in this room, every one of us, students, leaders, campus ministers, church staff, pastors, speakers, every single one of us, including myself, let's put our lives on the table before God and just say in a fresh way in this moment, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. Wherever you want me to go, I will go. No strings attached. So some of you already know God's leading you to go, like you're ready to stand right now. Others of you aren't sure. Some of you believe God's leading you to stay seated. What I'm proposing is we pray and let God determine that over the next few minutes. So let's bow our heads together. Our Father in heaven, this is such an awesome reality that we are meeting with you right now, that you are with us, that you, the creator, God of the universe, are with us, that your presence is with us, your spirit is among us. So we ask that in the next few minutes, you would speak clearly to us all across this room by your spirit, through your word, that you would keep the adversary from distracting us from hearing your voice, from doubting you when we hear your voice, from deceiving us into thinking that your voice cannot be trusted. Help us, 
Help us to hear you clearly and help us to obey you completely. We pray, no matter what you say, no matter what that means, with all kinds of unanswered questions, but with trust in you. So we pray, oh God, the next few minutes, we pray that you would set apart men and women. You would do in this room whatever you did in Paul and Barnabas' life 2,000 years ago. And we ask this so that the nations might feel the waves in the future of your grace and your gospel and your glory being made known among them as a result of what happens in the next few minutes here. With great anticipation, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you ready? If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, let me invite you to open with me to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1, we have walked on a journey through the pages of Scripture. We have beheld a God who is passionate about His glory being made known among all peoples, whether through blessing or judgment. I hope we've seen that the Bible is a clear affront to all of our pride, for it declares that everything in the universe and everything in our lives revolves around God. Your life does not revolve around you. That's why we pray what we just prayed, right? My life does not revolve around me. Our lives revolve around God, and He has designed it this way. It's fall. I was preaching at a conference on the Psalms, and as I was meditating in preparation for preaching there, it just hit me what a interesting book of the Bible that is. And my, my wife is sitting over here. I thought, I, I imagine, imagine if I were to go to my wife and say, hey babe, I wrote some poems about how great I am and I want to give them to you as a gift. Like, there's 150 of them. <laughs> and just, just my greatness from all kinds of different angles. And I just, I want you to read them to me, and it's going to be so good for you. <laughs> this is what God has given us. This is how God has wired us to find our greatest pleasure in glorifying Him and worshiping Him and loving Him and declaring Him, proclaiming Him in all the world. So going and sending to the world only makes sense if God is worthy of all worship in the world, and He is. So now we come to the culmination, not just of the Bible, but all of history, the book of Revelation. I read somewhere that Revelation is the book people in the church most want to hear taught because they don't understand it. And Revelation is the book preachers in the church least want to teach because they don't understand it either. I'm not going to presume to have it all figured out, but I do believe the theme of the book is crystal clear. Just listen to the first five words. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is about Jesus. John is writing a letter to suffering, persecuted Christians in the first century who were tempted to shrink back from their faith, compromise with the culture, shrink, shirk their mission in the world. So. What does God inspire John to write about? Jesus. Show them the end of all history and show them Jesus at the center of it. And they will be compelled to live and to die, pursuing him and proclaiming him to the ends of the earth. So I want to do something that I've not done before in a setting like this. I want to preach a 50-point sermon. That's five zero fifty. So, now I assure you my points will not be as long as John Piper's points. <laughs> I would actually maintain that John Piper had 50 points last night masked as point one. <laughs> but here's what I want to do, here's what I want to do, and obviously we're going to go to a pretty good clip, but I want to show you 48 characteristics of Jesus in the book of Revelation. And I'll go and tell you, this is not all of them. We won't even touch most of the chapters in this book, but I want to ravish you. I, I pray by God's grace, awe you with a portrait of Jesus in this book, because I believe that if we see Jesus, if we'll just see Jesus for who he is, and we'll see Jesus where all of history is headed around him, then radical going and radical sending will make total sense. I know of no greater motivation for missions than a 
than getting a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. So, 48 characteristics that will lead to two exhortations. So if you're taking notes, here we go. Revelation 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, we're about to read one of the most majestic portraits of Jesus in all of Scripture from verses 12 to 20 in chapter 1. But think about John's assignment here. This voice like a trumpet booms and says, write what you see in a book. That's not easy. It's one thing to write down words that you hear. It's a whole other thing to write down in words the wonder of what you see with your eyes. It's like you have a pen and a piece of paper and somebody says, write down what you see in the Grand Canyon. And you're like, uh, there's no way to put on here the grandeur of what I see out there. So that's what John's trying to do here. So feel the difficulty of his task. As he turns, he sees the voice. How do you see a voice? He sees the voice of the one speaking to him and he attempts to describe him in words. He is like a son of man. Verse 13, characteristic number one. Jesus is fully human fully human. Just imagine John's perspective. He'd spent three years with Jesus on earth, every day, walking, talking, eating together. After three years, he'd seen Jesus brutally slaughtered on a cross. Three days later, rising from the grave, later sending into heaven. That's the last glimpse John had of Jesus. Now he turns and he sees him again, Jesus, as a man and as God. Number two, Jesus is fully God. All throughout this picture, we see links between Jesus and God the Father. So earlier in Revelation 1, God had spoken and said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Now Jesus speaks in this passage and says, I am the first and the last. Jesus is God. There are so many allusions here in Revelation to passages in the Old Testament. Daniel 7, one of them, where God is described as the Ancient of Days, whose clothing is white as snow, whose hair is like pure wool. Yet here, that is the description of Jesus. John is describing Jesus in terms that are used only for God in the Bible. Jesus is fully man, Jesus is fully God. Number three, Jesus is the fulfillment of centuries of prophecy. Daniel 7 and 10, we see a vision of a son of man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold around his waist with eyes like flaming torches, arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, whose voice echoes like the sound of a multitude. The picture of a son of man ushering in the kingdom of God. That's what we have here in Revelation 1, just like it had been prophesied centuries before. So realize, as we see this passage, this is not John's answer to the question, uh, what is Jesus wearing in heaven? What kind of fashion sense does he have? No, these are images that would have been familiar to John's readers that would have triggered in their minds the words of prophets, would have evoked in their hearts awe and wonder at the vision of the one the Bible had spoken about centuries before. 300 specific references over 1,000 years to the coming of Christ down to where he would be born, the circumstances that would surround his birth, his life, and his death. He is the fulfillment of centuries of prophecy. Next characteristic, number four, Jesus is the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin. He is clothed with a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. Six of the seven times a long robe like this is mentioned in the Old Testament, it refers to the clothing of the high priest who would enter into the most holy place, the holy of holies, the holy presence of God to offer sacrifices for the sinful people of God. So Jesus here is pictured as the one who has entered into the presence of God the Father and is offered once and for all, full and final, sacrifice for the sins of God's people. He is the final and ultimate sacrifice for sin. Number five, Jesus is infinitely old. The hairs of his head are white, like white wool, like snow, a deliberate picture of age. For Jesus has existed forever. He did not begin, Jesus has always been. He is infinitely old and he is infinitely wise. Number six, in ancient culture, white hair was a symbol of accumulated wisdom through years of experience. The experience, the wisdom of Jesus knows no end. Which leads to number seven, Jesus sees all things. 
He sees all things. His eyes are like a flame of fire. Nothing escapes his gaze. He sees it all. He sees through it all. Jesus sees through all pretense. He searches every area of our hearts. He sees the purity of our hearts, and he sees the stains of our hearts. He sees everything we would like to hide. Nothing in your life or my life escapes the pure and penetrating gaze of Jesus Christ, which means Jesus knows all things. Number eight, he knows all things. This image of Jesus... Eyes like fire reappears in his letter to Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, to whom Jesus says, I know everything about you. He knows everything. Jesus knows everything about you and everything about me, the things that nobody else knows. Number nine, Jesus' purity has no error. His purity has no error. His feet are like burnished bronze. Bronze metal would have been purified in a furnace and might glow in purity. Jesus is absolutely pure. His purity has no error. And number 10, Jesus' power knows no equal. His power knows no equal. Burnished with bronze, also a picture of glory and strength and might. His power knows no equal. Hang with me. Number 11, Jesus' voice resounds with authority. His voice resounds with authority. So first his voice was like a trumpet. Now it's like the roar of many waters. What imagery. And from his mouth, so get this picture, Revelation 1 says, from his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. We have seen its double edge all throughout the last few days as we have walked through scripture. Blessing and judgment, mercy and wrath. So this is number 12. Jesus declares eternal salvation. He declares eternal salvation for all who trust in him. Mercy is available to you. His mercy is more. It is sufficient to cover all your sin. He declares eternal salvation. At the same time, number 13, Jesus decrees final judgment for all who turn from him, for all who do not trust in him. Jesus is the judge whose declaration will finally and forever decide your fate my fate. And Jesus is the judge whose declaration will decide the fate of 7.3 billion people in the world alive right now. His voice resounds with authority. Number 14, Jesus' face radiates with light. His face radiates with light like the sun shining in full strength, which causes John to fall on his face as though dead. I love this. Jesus lays his right hand on John and says, fear not. I am the first. Number 15, Jesus had the first word in creation. He had the first word in creation. We heard this last night, Colossians 1. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus is before all things. In Jesus, all things hold together. He had the first word in creation. And number 16, Jesus will have the last word in creation. Jesus will fully and finally usher in new creation. Jesus is the force behind all of human history. He alone is able to bring the divine plan and purposes to pass because he has conquered. You see, number 17, Jesus was dead for a time. I love this. It says in verse 18, I died, comma, that's usually a period but not with Jesus. I died, comma, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Jesus was dead for a time. Now number 18, Jesus is alive for all time. He is the living one who will never die again. We're not talking resuscitation, reincarnation. We're talking resurrection. We're not talking uh, passed out, went to heaven, came back, wrote a best-selling book about it. We're talking dead for three days. We're talking you go to a funeral tomorrow, you see a man's body put in a grave, you, that dirt is poured over that grave, you, you next weekend are walking on the street and that guy comes up to you and says hello. That's unusual. It's crazy. It's crazy. Good. It's the greatest news in all the world. Jesus is not dead. He is alive for all time, which means, number 19, death is controlled by Jesus. He controls it. I have the keys of death and Hades. Keys, a symbol of authority. Jesus says, I have authority over death. I speak and death listens. I speak and death obeys. Which means, this is really good news, 
Because Jesus has authority over death, he has the ability to turn death into gain. For you, for me, for all who trust in him, since our last cross, a close friend of mine named Jonathan became really sick. This is a brother, the brother who has personally taught me more about missions than anybody else I know. We served together alongside each other for years. He had started a business in Afghanistan because he wanted to shine the light of Christ there. But a few years ago, they found a tumor on Jonathan's brain. He's about my age. He fought that tumor for years. It was getting worse. I was flying in from a trip overseas when I received word that doctors had said it was time to move from treating the tumor to just trying to keep him comfortable. So I immediately got off a plane in Atlanta, went to Birmingham instead of going straight up to Metro Washington. I went to his house and I just sat by his bedside and we talked for hours late into the night. He whispered most of the time. It took a lot of energy for him to have a conversation. But we reminisced and we laughed and we cried and we prayed and we talked about scripture. Like scripture was just flowing from him. We talked about family. We wanted to talk mission strategy. There was one point I had to step out so that the palliative care people could talk with him. And he could sign some papers basically saying they could let him die. And I came back in while they're setting up a bed for him in his room and he just looked at me and he whispered, he said, David, God is good. He told me about calling his three kids into the room earlier that day, they're 14, 12, and nine, and explaining to them what it means to bring in hospice for their dad. And he looked at these kids who were crying with him and he told them, kids know this, I believe this. Don't forget this, God is good. So, a couple weeks later, he was surrounded by his wife and those three kids who love and adore their dad. Some friends who shared life with him, they gathered around his bed, they're praying, they're reading the word, they're singing. They could tell things were getting close and they sang because he lives. And they got to that last verse. Then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns. They sung the last chorus. And my brother in Christ, Jonathan, took his last breath. Praise God, Jesus is in control of death. And he turns it into life. So, so that's... That's 19 characteristics. That leads us to Revelation chapter five. So we're skipping over like all kinds of stuff in these chapters. So we got a vision of God the Father on his throne in chapter four. John writes in chapter five, verse one, then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So this scroll contains God's foreordained plans for the redemption and restoration of creation. Think plans for the ultimate eradication of, eradication of evil and death and sin in the world, the final removal of suffering and pain and persecution. This is the end of all world wars and physical diseases and natural disasters, the coming of God's kingdom to man, recreation of a new heaven and a new earth where God's people will enjoy him, reign with him forever and ever. It's all on the scrolls. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seal? Who's able to bring these things about? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Why is John weeping like this? He is overwhelmed by the prospect of the future without all these things, no redemption, no restoration, no eradication of evil, no final justice, no final removal of sin and suffering and pain, persecution, no defeat of death, no hope. So amidst John's hopeless wailing, one of the elders said, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Number 20, Jesus is the conquering lion. He is the conquering lion. First prophesied in the first book of the Bible, Genesis 49, 10, the lion of the tribe of Judah, to whom shall be the obedience of all the peoples. The conquering lion is here. So see the contrast here between one minute not being able to open the scroll, next minute somebody being able to open the scroll. Think of 
throughout history, from the beginning of time, men have come, men have gone, women have come, women have gone, all of them, the noblest of them, the kindest of them, the strongest of them, the greatest of them, all of them have fallen prey to sin, all of them, generation after generation, century after century, every single man and every single woman on the earth has succumbed to death and sin, but then came another man unlike any other man who did not fall prey to sin, He possessed power over sin. He was not captive to Satan. This man came to crush Satan. He did not succumb to death. He triumphed over death. The root of David, the lion of the tribe of Judah has come and he has conquered. How? John rises to look at this strong lion, but to his surprise, verse six, between the throne and the four living creatures and among the leaders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. The conquering lion is a slaughtered lamb. Number 21, Jesus is the slaughtered lamb. This vision recorded by the apostle who wrote that John the Baptist, when seeing Jesus, said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hearkening back to language in Exodus chapter 12, when the Israelites took an innocent lamb into their homes, kept it until the 14th day, killed it, spread its blood over their doorposts. The people of God saved from the judgment of God under the banner of the blood of a lamb. Isaiah, centuries later, speaks of a lamb who would be led to the slaughter, prophesies the only son of God will be crushed according to the sovereign will of God. So how does the lion conquer? By suffering as a lamb. He conquers through crucifixion. He is marred, despised, rejected, stricken, smitten, afflicted, wounded, chastised, oppressed, and pulverized in the place of sinners so that all who hide under the banner of his blood are safe. He's the slaughtered lamb of God, and yet he is standing. I don't know if you've ever seen a slaughtered lamb, but they don't stand. This lamb, though, is different. This lamb has endured death and defeated death. This is the greatest news in all the world. The slaughtered lamb of God reigns as the sovereign Lord of all. Number 22, Jesus is the sovereign Lord. So this lion-like lamb goes, verse seven, and takes the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throat. What audacity. Nobody in heaven or on earth under there is able to take the scroll. Yet Jesus walks right up to the throne, surrounded by living creatures and elders and a host of angels, and he takes it from the hand of God the Father. And the angels sing a new song, this time to the Lamb, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Oh, number 23, Jesus' worth is undisputed. His worth is undisputed. Jesus alone is worthy. He alone has the key to all of human history. He alone has the power to bring about the consummation of the kingdom of God. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive, verse 12, sevenfold perfect praise, power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, blessing. There is no one like him. No gods in India. No idols, spirits, and animism. No figures in Buddhism. No prophet in Islam. No one anywhere compares with the worth of Jesus. His worth is undisputed. Number 24, Jesus' work is unforgettable. His work is unforgettable. Oh, don't miss this. This is heaven. Christ is risen, yet he is seen as a lamb that looks like it's been slaughtered. The implication is clear. For all of eternity, we will see the conquering lion and sovereign Lord ruling as the slaughtered lamb. Crown him the Lord of love. Behold his hands and side, those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. His work is unforgettable. Number 25, Jesus' worship is universal. He has purchased people for God from all the peoples of the earth. Jesus did not die on the cross for the praise of one type of people. He died for the praise of every type of people on the planet. He will receive the reward of his sufferings. The great commission will be accomplished and a kingdom of men and women from every language singing about his salvation. His worship is universal. That leads us to a similar vision in chapter seven. So we're over halfway there, stay with me. Verse 9 of chapter 7, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Number 26, Jesus is the author of our salvation. 
He's the author of our salvation. Salvation belongs to him, comes from him alone. John goes on to describe these worshipers. He says in verse 15 of chapter seven, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They will hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. Then verse 17, for the lamb, here's the lamb, Jesus in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Number 27, Jesus is the shepherd of our souls. Jesus is the good shepherd who will guide us to that day. Jesus is the great shepherd, shepherd who does not lose one sheep that belongs to the Father. No one can snatch us out of his hand. He is the shepherd of our souls. Verse, it goes on to say, and he will guide them to springs of living water. Number 28, Jesus is the source of our satisfaction. Jesus is the source of our satisfaction. Oh, college students, drink deeply from the fountain of the fullness of Jesus. 18 to 25 year olds, surrounded by so many promises of pleasure, so many people, possessions, pursuits in this world that promise satisfaction but cannot deliver. Your soul is designed by God to be delighted in God alone. So drink from his cup. He is better. Jesus is so much better than all the best things of this world put together. He's better than that guy. He's better than that girl. He's better than that image. He's better than that pursuit. He's better than that money. He's better than it all put together. He's better than it all. He's the source of our satisfaction. It's Revelation 7. All right, we got to jump to the end. We got to jump to the end of the book. Revelation 19. It's just a travesty to skip over all these chapters, but don't think a hundred point sermon would work. So, Revelation 19, Revelation 19 depicts shouting in heaven, songs of hallelujah. Did you know Revelation 19 is the only time in the entire New Testament we see the word hallelujah? It's like the whole New Testament has been building to this. After 26 books, 18 chapters of Jesus coming to the earth, dying on a cross, rising from the grave, ascending to heaven, sending his spirit, inaugurating his church, being preached among the nations, history of the church. Now, when Jesus ultimately comes back, heaven fully and finally shouts hallelujah, praise the Lord. So skip halfway down to verse six, hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Oh, what imagery, 29th characteristic. Jesus is the groom who chooses us as his bride. He's the groom who chooses us as bride. We're his bride. Like, I remember when my bride over here stepped into a room one day, everybody stood up, turned and looked at her. I'm standing down front, beaming, trying to stand still on the outside, but inside thinking, boom, that's my bride. (laughs) It's my bride, not your bride, not your bride. That's my wife. (laughs) Just to be clear, that's my wife. Think about it, Jesus has chosen you as his bride. Me as his bride, us as his bride. And he beams over us, get the picture. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. How awesome is this? Jesus is the groom who chooses his bride. And then Jesus, number 30, is the God who makes us beautiful. He makes us beautiful. Think about it, you and me. Men and women with sin sick, sin stains hearts. Men and women who have given in over and over again to the pride and anger and lust and selfishness and immorality and idolatry around us in this world. Now standing before the holy God of the universe dressed in white fine linen. How is that possible? Because he granted us clothes of righteousness. Don't, don't, don't miss the picture here. Revelation is giving us a picture of the church through the eyes of Christ. The bride through the eyes of a groom, of the groom. Think about it. No, no groom looks at his bride on their wedding day and thinks, huh, looks okay. Like, no. She just looks at you and me and says, this, you are my bride and you are beautiful. Just let that soak in. 
I don't know what guilt you are carrying around in your soul, what accusations from the enemy you can't get out of your mind. But we skipped over Revelation 21. His accusations will stop. And Jesus' promises will prove true. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Brothers and sisters, by the grace of Jesus Christ, you are a spotless bride, bright and pure. Sin leads to verse 11. John writes, I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. So the one who came into Jerusalem riding on a humble donkey is coming out of heaven riding on a war horse. Number 31, Jesus is the faithful witness. The one sitting on the horse is called faithful and true. Chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 3, verse 14, both call Jesus the faithful witness who is true to his word. He's the faithful witness. Number 32, Jesus is the righteous judge. In righteousness, he judges, John says. Jesus is coming to right the wrong, to dispense the righteous justice of God fully and finally for all. Number 33, he is the divine warrior. Jesus is the divine warrior. John says he makes war. Jesus is on the assault against evil and injustice and unrighteousness in the world. So the next time you ever find yourself in Nepal or in Thailand and you're, you're seeing young girls trafficked for sex and you're seeing little boys trafficked in this fishing ministry where they're put on boats to work until they can't work anymore. And when they're not productive, they're just thrown overboard. And you find yourself praying, God, please either save these traffickers or smite them. You pray that with confidence that justice is coming. The divine warrior is coming. Number 34, there's a flaming fire in Jesus' eyes. An almost exact quotation of verse 12. His eyes are like a flame of fire, much like we had seen in chapter 1. There's a flaming fire in Jesus' eyes, and on his head are many diadems. Number 35, there are many crowns on Jesus' head. Many crowns on his head. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And follow this, there's flaming fire in Jesus' eyes. There are many crowns on his head. And number 36, there is much mystery to Jesus' name. There's much mystery to Jesus' name. So there's a lot of ambiguity about what this means in verse 12. What we do know is the name for God in Scripture reveals the character of God. The name for Jesus reveals the character of Jesus. So the picture here seems to be a fullness of Jesus' character that is still yet to be revealed until the day when he returns and we see him as he is, which makes sense, doesn't it? Jesus' majesty and beauty are infinite. Do you realize what that means? For all of eternity, there will be more beauty and more majesty to discover in Jesus. Like 10 trillion years from now, we're still gonna be seeing new majesty and new beauty. Like forever, infinite beauty. We will never, ever, ever get tired of Jesus. He will awe us forever. Number 37, Jesus conquers God's enemies. He conquers God's enemies. This is where the imagery gets graphic. Jesus is clothed here in a robe dipped in blood, which could be a reference to the blood he shed on the cross, but in light of the context here is more likely a reference to the judgment Jesus is coming to bring. Isaiah 63 speaks of one coming in crimson garments, splendid in apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save, with red apparel, because he treads the winepress of God's wrath. Which we'll see in a minute in this passage. Jesus' is coming is the clear conqueror of God's enemies. Number 38, Jesus reveals God's word. He reveals God's word, verse 19, the name by which he is called is the word of God. Jesus is the authoritative word, capital W. He is the revelation of God. Jesus reveals God's word, number 39. Jesus rules the nations of the world. He rules the nations of the world. He's followed by the armies of heaven. 
From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Praise God. Kim Jong-un in North Korea is not sovereign over the world, and neither is Putin in Russia, neither is Xi in China or Modi in India, and praise God, Donald Trump is not sovereign over the world. Jesus rules over all of them. He rules the nations and all of their leaders. He holds them in the palm of his hands. He rules all of them. Number 40, Jesus treads the winepress of God's wrath. I mentioned that earlier from Isaiah 63. Now it's here. That's an exact quotation from the end of Revelation 19, 15. All who do not trust in Jesus will experience the winepress of God's wrath. I know we have talked about this. May it just continually soak in. When we talk about the unreached, they, the wine press of God's wrath for all who don't trust in Jesus, they can't trust in Jesus if they never hear about Jesus. At least, God, they need to hear. How can they believe if they don't hear, Paul says in Romans 10. If they don't hear about Jesus, they will experience the wine press of God's health. Like, God, help. God's wrath. God, help us. God, help us to lift our eyes to the urgency. That's why it's uh, urgent patience. I think about, think about being in Nepal and seeing bodies put on a funeral pyre and set ablaze 24 af- hours after they died and ashes going down in this river, believing that's helpful in the process of carnation, reincarnation and thinking, realizing, like, this is I'm looking at these burning, I'm smelling burning bodies and realizing I'm looking at a physical picture of a spiritual reality. And most, if not all these people, never even had a chance to hear about how they go to heaven. What will it take for the concept of unreached people to be totally intolerable to us? Like, so, there's more bodies being put on funeral pyres today in Nepal and tomorrow in Nepal and the next day. There's an urgency that comes with a view of eternity. Number 41, Jesus is King of Kings. And number 42, Jesus is Lord of Lords. On his robe, verse 16 says, and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Which leads us into chapter 21, where we find characteristic number 43. Number 43, Jesus will usher us in to the presence of God. So this is our hope. New heaven, new earth, Revelation chapter 21. And so many Christians have such a paltry view of heaven. I do not think about new heaven and new earth in merely spiritual terms, like heaven is not. And This new heaven, new earth is not an ethereal, otherworldly picture. We're all sitting on clouds in the sky in some spirit world. The Bible is picturing here a very earthly heaven, a new earth. We'll have physical resurrected bodies in a real physical world, which is important. I think many of us, when we think about heaven, if we're really honest, have a pretty boring picture of what it's going to be like. What are we going to do? Just stand around with each other and sing songs and stare at light for a few quadrillion years? And the answer Scripture gives is no, no, no. There's so much more. The presence of God. This is not just endless choir practice we're going to. This is a place where we're going to experience the fulfillment of all our desires in the presence of God in a new earth, a complete earth, not a place where we have nothing to do but float on clouds, but a new earth where we have everything to do, a God to worship and a kingdom to rule, a universe to explore, family to enjoy. Others read Revelation 1 and think, oh, so this is the architecture of what heaven will look like, and there's numbers and measurements and charts what heaven's going to look like, but that is not the point. I think it actually misses the point. We don't have time to dive into all this, but you look at the measurements here in Revelation 21, you realize heaven is shaped like a cube, and you think, why would that be? It takes us all the way back to the temple and the tabernacle in the Old Testament, where you'll never guess what the dwelling place of God among his people in the Holy of Holies was shaped like. Shaped like a cube. You put together these measurements, and you start to realize this is like one giant, massive Holy of Holies, and all of a sudden it hits you. The whole point of heaven is that we're going to be ushered fully into the presence of God, unhindered. And that's the whole point, Revelation 21. 
4, behold, the dwelling of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them as their God. This is the point of heaven, not what this wall or that gate will look like, but the fact that one day the skies will open up, this earth will be rolled back like a scroll. God's holy dwelling will literally come down to man and we will be with him. So what Jesus said in John 14, in my house are many rooms. The word there literally means dwelling place. It's the same word here. It's really unfortunate how that, some translations have mansions there. So people talk about the mansion that's waiting for them in heaven. How big is your mansion gonna be? As if God is trying to compete with Western luxury and his eternal abode. I think about one, one place where I had been invited to preach and said they wanted to put me up in a, a home with a church member. So uh, we drive up to a massive mansion uh, and was escorted to my room, this luxurious room go out and look, there's all this land and cows and stables that are nicer than homes. Sit down to eat in the dining room. One of the cows from outside is placed on the plate. And it was, it was, always, it was, uh, it was always the case when I was a place like this, Heather would not have traveled with me. But then when I was ever like put up at like the gas station motel, Heather was right there with me. It's like, ah, oh, sorry, babe. So I'm calling up Heather, like thinking about another place. Like, uh, uh, so they said, we're going to put you in a basement. I thought, okay, that's fine. Uh, but this was not your average basement. This was this like palatial basement, like a massive big screen TV, a big hot tub right in front of the TV uh, during football season. And so, you know, again, Heather not with me, like, ah, it's really a bummer. So uh, anyway, <laughs> so w- when we think about heaven, we start thinking, oh, all the stuff we, we, we've ever wanted, we're going to have. Like, you know, heaven is so much better than that. When you think about heaven, do not think about a place with all the amenities this world has to offer. Think about a place where the amenities of this world do not compare with the fact that we are dwelling with God. Like, we don't come to Christ to get stuff. We, come to, we, come, we don't come to God to get stuff. We come to God to get God. And the culmination of our salvation is God. He will be with us. We will be with him. There will be no more sin, no more sorrow. God personally wiping every tear from our eyes. No more sickness, no more cancer, no more tumors, no more hurts, aches, pains, no more sudden heart attacks like the one that ended my dad's life. No more hunger and starvation and trafficking and AIDS. No more death, everything new. One of my favorite quotes from Johnny Erickson Tata. She's quadriplegic. She talks about her hope. Heaven with God. Just restoration, everything new. She said, I hope in some way I can take my wheelchair to heaven. With my new glorified body, I will stand up on resurrected legs and I will be next to the Lord Jesus and I will feel those nail prints in his hands and I will say, thank you, Jesus. He will know I mean it because he will recognize me from the inner sanctum of sharing in the fellowship of his sufferings. He will see that I was one who identified with him in the sharing of his sufferings, so my gratitude will not be hollow. And then I will say, Lord Jesus, do you see that wheelchair over there? Well, you were right. When you put me in it, it was a lot of trouble. But the weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. I do not think I would have ever known the glory of your grace were not for the weakness of that wheelchair. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. And now, if you like, you can send that thing off to hell. Boom. (laughs) Jesus is going to usher us into the presence of God. Leading to chapter 22, number 44, Jesus will completely undo the curse of God. When you get to chapter 22, the imagery shifts from the new heaven and the new earth as a city and a temple to a garden with river and trees, a garden that looks a lot like the garden the Bible began with. Remember the Thabiti's showing us the sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life in Genesis 3? Now read Revelation 22. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, here it is, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything a curse. Jesus will completely undo the curse of God. The throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. He will open the door then. Undoing the curse, open the door for the five most beautiful words I believe in all the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 4. They will see his face. Characteristic number 45. Jesus will open our eyes to the face of God. Fanny Crosby, famous hymn writer, blind her entire life. Hear her poem. This part of it, my Savior first of all. Remember, she's blind. This means the first time she's ever going to see heaven. 
She says, when my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and his smile will be the first to welcome me. Through the gates of the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me to where no tears will ever fall, and the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight, but I long to see my Savior first of all. Aren't we, in a sense, in a sense, very similar in this, our vision here on earth blinded by sin. It is nothing compared to what we will see on that We will see his face. He will shine his light on us. Number 46, Jesus will shine his light on us. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light. Jesus will shine his light on us. Number 47, Jesus will share his reign with us. Verse five is shocking. Not he, as in Jesus, will reign, but they will reign forever and ever with him. They, we, will reign with Jesus. Jesus will share his reign with us. All leading to number 48. Number 48. Jesus will come back for us. The Bible ends with these words. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. And so the book closes with a prayer. Amen. May it be so. Come. I love the way C.S. Lewis ends his last paragraph in the book of the Narnia series. He writes, the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has, has ever read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. In the Revelation, in the Bible, is the beginning of a story where every chapter will be better than the one before. So I exhort you with this revelation, with this picture of Jesus before you, exhortation number one, pursue Jesus as the all-consuming passion of your life. Pursue Jesus, exhort you, pursue Jesus as the all-consuming passion of your life. And I phrase that very intentionally because I am not, and I don't believe the Bible is, exhorting you to pursue missions as the all-consuming passion of your life. This is so important. The most important question I could ask you today is not whether you're going to be a sender or a goer. The far more important, the far more fundamental question is, Does your heart beat for Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you want more than anyone or anything else? Do you want Jesus? A heart for missions, a heart for the nations springs from a heart for Jesus. And the last thing I, we want for this conference is to spend three days leading people to manufacture a heart for missions while we miss a heart for Christ. Don't manufacture a heart for missions and miss a heart for Jesus. Some might say a missions charge sermon like this should be filled with mission stories, not 48 points from the Bible about Jesus. But here's why I went the 48 points route. Because if I had just told stories of adventure and sacrifice, then you might be tempted to care more about adventure than Jesus. In a weird way, you, I even, might be tempted to care more about the idea of sacrifice than the one who sacrificed for you. So I ask you, right where you're sitting right now, does your heart right now beat for Jesus? I exhort you, to pursue him as the all-consuming passion of your life.
more than any guy, more than any girl, more than anyone, anything, more than money, more than comfort, more than safety, more than success, more than position. We could go on and on, more than anything. Count all things lost compared to the surpassing grace of knowing Jesus Christ. And then, as you do that, as you pursue him, then exhortation number two, spend your life for the fame of his name where he is not yet known. Spend your life for the fame of Jesus' name where he is not yet known. We have seen it in scripture. Like nobody's making up anything, it's in the Bible. The end of all history is the exaltation of Jesus' name among the nations. That is where all of history is headed. So I ask every person in this room then, how is your life going to be spent toward that end? How is your life going to be spent for the fame of Jesus' name where he is not yet known? Max said it the first night, Every generation has a choice. You have a choice. And I pray that you will choose to say, Jesus is my life, and I want to spend it so that the nations might be glad in him, so that the nations might give glory to him. So, in the presence of this Jesus, like he's here. We come to a moment of decision. What is he leading you to do? And if you would say today, and believe he's leading me to communicate to my church and desire to go as a missionary, take the gospel to places where it's not gone, people where it's not gone. If you would say that in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand just right where you are. And after you have stood, we are going to gather around and pray for you. And if you sense God, Jesus saying to you, as far as you know, I'm calling you to stay, to make disciples right where you live in your, this culture, to work, to send other brothers and sisters to places where the gospel's not yet gone, then I'm gonna invite you to stay seated and to be joyfully confident and content in that. So this is, again, not a call for a two-tier class of Christians. This is a call for obedience to Christ. So we've, we have prayed. Matthew 9, 37 and 38, that God would raise up laborers for his harvest field during this time so this is a call for laborers to go to new harvest fields that are waiting to hear the gospel. So if you believe by his spirit, through his word, God is setting you apart, might be setting you apart to go as a missionary across barriers for the spread of the gospel, you're gonna pursue that possibility with your local church. Then I wanna invite you to stand where you are in this room right now. Anybody else? What I want us to do while you're standing is in just a moment, we're gonna gather around these brothers and sisters. I am uh, just pretty overwhelmed by God's grace and his answering. At Matthew 9 prayer. And you, so here's the mind, here's the immediate picture that just went into my mind. The immediate picture just went into my mind was Mac and Leanne Stiles standing at a conference similar to this. And, and the 
glory of Christ spreading in Dubai and the glory of Christ spreading in Erbil, in northern Iraq. And just, it's overwhelming to think what God might do in the goers and the cinders in this room. So uh, I want to invite you to pull out that card. Hopefully you received when you came in. Everybody stay standing if you're standing. And what's going to happen is we are together going to pray for those who go. We're going to pray out loud. So these are prayers that John Piper actually asked him to write out a prayer for those who go and those who send. And so we're going to pray out loud together, corporately pray this to God for those who go. And these brothers are going to help lead us just corporately through praying. And then what's going to happen is we're going to flip it and we're going to pray for those who sin. So here's what I want to invite us to do. So this is not the church in Antioch exactly by any means, but I do think it would be more than appropriate for those who are seated as sinners to stand up now and gather around, put hands on shoulders of those who are standing. And just put a hand on their shoulders, with one hand there, one hand holding this card, and the beady is gonna start by leading us to pray for those who go. And so you just pray along with the beady, then Zane, and then Trip. And I wanna ask, so if you stood, you just be prayed for during this time. So those who were cinders, we're going to be praying for the goers. So if you stood, you just be, yeah, be prayed for. And then when we flip the card, we'll switch it around. And you put hands on other shoulders, and you'll pray for those cinders. And we'll pray out loud for them. So, make sense? So, and if you pray both times, it's okay. So, all right. The beating, why don't you start us, brother? Let's pray together, beloved. We praise you, O God, that you created and governed all things, from the farthest stars to the flight of sparrows. You hold your servants and all the peoples in your hand. Your purposes for them cannot be thwarted. You have sent into this world your Son, Jesus Christ, the God-man, and you have made him worthy to lead your mission. He was slain, and by his blood, he ransomed people from every tribe and language and nation. And wonder of wonders, you have made a way for every rebel who repents and trusts in your son to escape your wrath and enter everlasting joy. All authority in heaven and on earth is yours. And you have promised, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And you have said to everyone that you have sent, I will be with you always to the end of the age. In this confidence, O Father, We pray for those in whom the mystery of your missionary call has been discerned, your goers. Open the eyes of their hearts day by day to see in your word the immeasurable greatness of Christ. Deepen and strengthen and sweeten their faith in your promises. Be their supreme treasure. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Keep them pure and passionate for your name. May they love your church. May they live and speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God unto salvation. Use them, O God, to relieve much suffering, especially eternal suffering. May they be unwavering before all opposition. And whether they live or die, may they magnify Christ and say to the end, To live is Christ, and to die is gain. In Jesus' name, amen. So now I invite you to flip that card over and reverse the laying on of hands. We're going to pray for the cinders. So just turn to those around you, and Mac and Richard, uh, 
and Conrad are going to lead us to pray for the cinders in the same way. Gracious Father in heaven, we pray for those whose calling is to send your emissaries to the unreached peoples of the world, to hold the ropes as they descend the cliffs. Forbid that any of your people should think that this great global cause is not their affair. Grant instead that your purpose to be known and glorified among all the peoples of the world would be the thrill of every Christian soul. Our Lord, teach your sending people that they are not their own, that they are bought with a price. Show them their bodies, their souls, their minds, their families, their skills, and all their possessions are yours. Cause them to know and feel the joyful privilege that they are stewards, managers, not owners. Take them deep into your holy word and show them your Christ-exalting, mission-advancing, soul-saving purposes for their lives and resources. Protect them from the illusion that pursuing riches satisfies and show them that your purpose for their possessions is that they use them to show that Christ is more precious than possessions. Father, make your senders more than givers. Make them dreamers and travelers and encouragers and studious and trainers and strategizers and mobilizers and intercessors. Catch them up into the greatest enterprise in the world, your mission to magnify Christ among the nations. Don't let them waste their lives on things that do not last. And when they grow weary, remind them with great faith that you will make all grace abound to them so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, they may abound in every good work in Jesus' name, amen. So now I want us all to pray together. John Piper is going to lead us to intercede together as goers and senders for the nations. And so as he lifts this prayer, we unite our hearts together all across this convention hall. Lord Jesus, you have promised that this gospel will be preached throughout all the world as a testimony to all the peoples, and then the end will come. You have promised that you have other sheep that are not of this fold, and that you must bring them, and they will hear your voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. You have promised, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You have promised all the ends of the earth shall remember and bow down and all the families of the peoples will worship for kingship belongs to you and you rule over the nations. And you have promised this is impossible with men but not with God for all things are possible with God. And therefore we ask you, we are asking the Father, through all your glorious mediation and your blood, to bring the nations to you. Father, open the hearts of the unreached peoples of the world as they hear the gospel through these and tens of God. thousands yes. of others that you are touching yes, today. God. 
Yes. Open their hearts. Take out the heart of stone. Put in the heart yes. of flesh. Yes. Shine into their hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Amen. Overcome deadness. Yes. Give light. inclinations toward the word of God so that when spokesmen for the gospel show up, they will be Stunned at how ready people are. Give breakthroughs this very day, oh God, for faithful missionaries who have labored for decades and seen little or no immediate fruit. Grant, I pray, that today would mark a new day of breaking through the unreached peoples and the nations of the world. Amen. Put down the devil. Cause him to fall like lightning from heaven today in the name of Jesus so that the bondage in which he holds the world, the whole world lies under the evil one, John says, but he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So break the back of the evil one today in Louisville, in this room, and around the world. Yes. Deliver nations from darkness, O oh God, and you Use the power of the gospel, the power of the gospel unto salvation to that end. Amen. Oh God, keep faithful the goers and the senders in this room. I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
watching me.